Heavenly Father, we give you praise that you would send your son in our place to pay for our sin, to bring us to yourself. We cannot calculate that cost. We cannot appreciate that love to the degree that it deserves. God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that we would be as newborn babes who long for their mother's milk, that we would be those who long for your word, who crave to know you. This book is not merely a book of information or duties. It is the revelation of you. And we love you. We want to love you better. We, we know you by your grace, and we want to know you more. And we pray that we would have your heart, your thoughts here this morning. Speak through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be continuing our series on a philosophy of ministry. We've talked about how the church is to operate, and we've covered preach the word, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, grow the church, make disciples, and follow the script. And this morning's piece of a philosophy of ministry is identify error, identify error. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to zero in on 1 Timothy 4, 6 this morning. People can be ruthless at times. Some people enjoy pointing out the supposed flaws in others. When I was a kid, people made fun of my big ears. And they would say things like, hey, did you know your ears are big? Did you know that they stick out? Uh, more recently, the, the attention has turned to the lack of hair on the top of my head. And you'd be surprised how bold people are. Hey, you don't have any hair, said a third grader at the grocery store. <laughs> the mother looked horrified and snickered at the same time. I have a friend who's nearly seven feet tall, and regularly people would come up to him and say, man, you're tall, like it's a revelation to him. And that was often followed with the quip, you know, tall people die sooner. <laughs> it's distasteful, even unkind, to point out somebody's physical features as if something in their physical feature doesn't meet your standards. After all, what is someone supposed to do with a criticism of their unchangeable features? Your eyes are too close together. Your eyes are too far apart. Your nose is too short, too long. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Let me get that fixed. As someone once suggested to me, you know you can get your ears surgically pinned back. <laughs> Pointing out flaws in someone's doctrine, what someone believes may seem just as distasteful as pointing out the uniqueness of a person's physical traits. Unkind, lacking in love. To identify what someone believes as in error seems like a personal attack. Someone's belief is so personal. It feels like a part of who they are. No more right or wrong than the shape of their nose. And in a world that values tolerance over truth, Criticism of error has fallen on hard times. We exist in a live and let live mentality when it comes to truth. The only perspective not tolerated is a perspective that holds to absolute truth, universal truth. When someone claims to proclaim a true truth, a truth that is truly true, universally true, true for everyone true, then tolerance becomes violently intolerant. And you may have experienced that. This mindset has become the culture of the church, just like it has become the culture of the world around us. The church, which is, which is supposed to be the pillar and the support of the truth, has become a home and a testing ground for every idea under the sun. And part of a biblical philosophy of ministry, part of following God's script for how to do church, is the identification of error. It's not enough simply to proclaim the truth. There is a place for and a critical motivation for pointing out error, particularly when that error poses a threat to the church, to God's sheep, to his precious people. I want to read together the first 16 verses in 1 Timothy 4. 
I guess that's all the verses of 1 Timothy 4. And then we'll zero in on verse 6. Follow along as I read. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance." For it is, by, it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching." Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of the hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. We're going to talk this morning about a ministry that is pleasing to Christ. And according to 1 Timothy 4, 6, a ministry pleasing to Christ is engaged in two critical complementary activities, pointing out error and feeding on truth. Let's talk about a ministry pleasing to Christ. Notice that Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you, Timothy, will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. This is the main idea, and we're going to talk about the main idea first. You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. That is, a servant that is good and pleasing to Jesus. The word for servant here is the Greek word deacon. It's where we get the word for the office of deacon, but here it's used more generally just as a servant, a minister. Timothy would serve Jesus well in his pastoral ministry by means of these two critical activities, identifying error and feeding on the truth. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that he made it his ambition to be pleasing to the Lord. He is encouraging Timothy with the same ambition. One pastor said this, if you please God, it doesn't matter whom you displease. And if you displease God, it doesn't matter whom you please. John Calvin said, it is the highest honor of a godly pastor to be reckoned a good servant of Christ. So he ought to aim at nothing else during his whole ministry. That is the aim that Paul is enjoining Timothy towards here to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. And that good servant of Christ Jesus is given that qualification if and when Timothy were to fulfill these two critical complementary activities, pointing out error and feeding on truth. Let's look at that first one, pointing out error. Notice how the verse starts. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. This pointing out these things is is an ongoing, continuous activity. And these things refer to verses 1 to 5. We read them a few moments ago. Paul there is describing false teachers, their false teachings, and the correction to their error. That's the content of verse 5. Notice in verse 1, the result of their error is apostasy. Apostasy. 
the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. These are false professors in Jesus Christ who have become teachers in and amongst Jesus' church who then fall away from the faith. They were never genuine believers to begin with, but they were believers by the perception of others. The results of their error is apostasy. The cause of their error in the middle of verse 1 is paying attention to something, paying attention to something other than God's word. And this is a violation of the Psalm 1 principle. Do not stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, uh, make your delight in the law of the Lord. There's a progression of paying attention to untruths that leads down the path of apostasy. The results of their error is apostasy. The cause of their error is paying attention. The source of their error in the third part of verse 1 is demonic, deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons. Here we see the, the real source behind bad doctrine, behind the doctrine and false teaching that threatens God's church. It has satanic, demonic source. The means of their error is in verse 2, a seared conscience. A seared conscience. Notice how Paul says this. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own consciences as with a branding iron. These false teachers in 1 Timothy 4 knew that what they were saying was false. And they were preaching and teaching false doctrine ostensibly to gain a following after themselves. They did not prize the truth nor God's glory. They didn't really love God's people. They loved themselves. And so they knew what they were teaching was wrong. They're hypocrites. They know that they're lying. They're speaking falsely. And their consciences are seared. They don't have a soft conscience towards God. And there is a relationship, we'll talk about a little bit later this morning, between wrong doctrine and bad behavior. Not staying on short accounts with God. They've seared over their conscience. The content of their error, verse 3, is behavior contrary to God's word. Specifically in this context, false asceticism. They're forbidding people to get married. They're telling people to abstain from foods. This is outward behavior that actually goes contrary to God's instructions for his people. And it is intended by these false teachers to portray a false sense of spirituality. Follow my rules and you'll be really spiritual. These people had set themselves up as the self-styled gurus of their own little version of Christianity. They had the appearance of religion but denied its power. And verses 4 and 5 is Paul's correction of their error. The verb in verse 6, pointing out, uh, literally is to lay before. To, to set before the brethren these things, verses 1 to 5, false teaching, the false teachers, and the correction to their false doctrine. To set these things before believers. Uh, this is actually kind of a, a gentle word, a mild word. It's not a harangue or a tirade, but a calm, disciplined, setting before God's people the errors of bad teaching and the people who promote it. Let's connect this to the main idea in verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Pointing out error is a means by which Timothy would serve Christ well. Neglect here forfeits the right to be accounted worthy of the ministry. You're not a good servant if you do not follow this instruction. By avoiding the identification of error, a pastor fails to serve Jesus Christ well. I want you to imagine a banquet for a moment, a large banquet table, and it's filled with fresh vegetables and fruits and medium rare ribeye steaks, fresh breads, pastas, delicious beverages, an assortment of desserts, but distributed across the table, interspersed with the food items, but made to look like food are rat poison, cyanide, mayonnaise, and iocane powder. <laughs> it's important that you would have the ability to discriminate between what will provide nourishment and what will kill you. In the realm of theological error, there is a spectrum of ideas posing various degrees of harm. Some ideas are like rat poison, 
Some ideas are like Twinkies. Some ideas are like rice cakes, and some are like salmon kale salad. Uh, one nutritionist said that the two most nutritiously dense food items that you can intake are salmon and kale. I don't know why I needed to know that for this illustration. <laughs> but some ideas, if ingested, will cost you your eternity. Some ideas will cripple you, stunt your spiritual growth, inhibit your fruitfulness, produce confusion, and leave harmful effects on others. Some ideas are like rice cakes. There's just not much to them, positively or negatively. They take up space that could be used for better things. And biblical truth, sound doctrine, a steady diet of God's word will nourish your soul stabilize your life, cause you to grow, bring about much fruit, and be of eternal benefit to other people in your life. And Christians must learn to discern, to discriminate between the nutritious and the deadly, between what nourishes and what deteriorates spiritual life. And pastors, like Timothy, serve Jesus Christ well by pointing out these things to the brethren. What kind of host would you be if you invited hundreds of your dearest friends to that banquet knowing that the table had good food and mayonnaise on it? Sorry, I'll switch the illustration. Good food and Iocane powder. For a shepherd of God's people to say that he loves the Savior and he loves people but is content to leave poison on the table is a dereliction of duty. Such a servant has forsaken his calling and has left God's people vulnerable to the designs of the enemy. It has been regarded as uncouth in polite Christianity to name names. That is to actually publicly name a false teacher or specify some specific false teaching. But you need to know that avoiding specificity is not the New Testament model. Paul named names. He named specific people. He named ideas. He pointed out wrong teaching. He pointed out wrong teachers. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 3 and 6, he talked about certain men teaching strange doctrines, myths, endless genealogies, and speculations. In writing to Timothy and to the Ephesian church, Timothy and the Ephesians would know who these men were. Paul has associated these men with the very specific things they are teaching. He describes the things they taught. In chapter 1, he names Hymenaeus and Alexander. In chapter 5, he addresses specific women at Ephesus who were said to follow after Satan. In chapter 6, he points out those who are using supposed godliness for personal gain. And he points out men who sought to get rich and had wandered from the faith. In 2 Timothy 1, he names Phygelus and Hermogenes. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he names Hymenaeus and Philetus. They had wrong doctrine about the resurrection and they had upset the faith of believers. In chapter 3, he talked about evil men and imposters. They had a form of godliness but denied its power and they were deceiving people in the church. In chapter 4, there were those who wanted teachers that would teach the people what they wanted to hear rather than the truth of God's word. Paul was preparing the people to have discernment about such a teacher. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul names Demas, who left him out of love for the world. In chapter 4, Paul also names Alexander the coppersmith. He opposed the apostles' teaching and did much harm. Titus talks about the empty talkers and deceivers, rebellious men, upsetting families, and they must be silenced. Titus talks about those who profess God with their lips but deny him by their deeds. In Acts chapter 20, Paul warned the Ephesian elders that men would rise up from their own ranks to deceive and harm the church. In Romans 16, Paul warned the Roman believers about men who caused dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching you received. He called them slaves of their own appetites. He said they deceived the hearts of the unsuspecting. 
In Philippians 3, Paul points to specific men who were enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul says, I have often told you about them. In Philippians 4, 2, Paul even points out Yodia and Syntyche, two believers, women in the church who were arguing with each other. He names them by name and points out their bad behavior. In 2 Thessalonians 2, deceivers had written a letter in Paul's name to those believers that the day of the Lord had already come, and Paul had to correct that bad teaching. The entire book of Galatians was Paul's warning to the believers in Galatia about the false teachers who wanted to bring Christians under the law. These are specific ideas, specific teachings, specific doctrine, and specific false teachers pointed out by Paul. I believe the author of the book of Hebrews has written his entire letter, a sermonic letter, as a warning to Christians not to go back under Mosaic law. It is entirely addressed uh, to wrong thinking and wrong doctrine. John the Apostle named names, pointed to specific ideas. In 2 John 7, he said, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is deceiver and antichrist. He points to their specific doctrine. In 3 John 9, he names Diotrephes. Diotrephes opposed apostolic teaching. He mistreated believers, and he loved to have the first place in the church. And John called him out. Jesus named names. Think about the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. In Revelation 2, 2, Jesus describes evil men and false apostles. He names the Nicolaitans in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 6, a synagogue of Satan in verse 9. He calls in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the Nicolaitans as the teachings of Balaam. And he names Jezebel, a prophetess, a woman in the church, for her bad doctrine, her immorality, and her leading believers into the deep things of Satan. None of these things should be any surprise that bad doctrine and false teachers seek to infiltrate the church. Jesus said, many will say to me on that last day, in your name, didn't we do this and that and the other thing? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. We should expect lots of people to be dropping Jesus' name, attaching Jesus' name to their errant belief systems, attaching Jesus' name to their bad behavior. And the church must have discernment, an ability to detect the crucial differences between truth and error. This is God's description of the maturity of the church in Ephesians 4.14, to, to have discernment, to not be blown around by every wind of doctrine. And without discernment, the church will be subject to everything that blows through the culture. Faithful men throughout church history have named names and called out bad doctrine. Arius in the 300s was called out by Athanasius for denying the deity of Christ. Pelagius was called out by Augustine for his wrong view of God and his wrong view of man and therefore a, a non-gospel gospel. In the 20th century, false teachers have arisen in the church and, and carried many along, and, and I'll, I'll list a few that have had direct impact on people that I've been given charge to care for during pastoral ministry. Robert Schuler, TBN, The Toronto Blessing, Wild at Heart, Integrative Counseling, The Shack, Cults, LDS Mainstreaming. You know, when the Mormons come to your door and they say, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus and salvation is by grace through faith and Jesus is God. Have you had those Mormons come to your door? We have to have discernment. N.T. Wright. No name wolves in sheep's clothing who come into the church and teach others wrong doctrine. And listen, we live in a recipe for disaster. Our restless attraction to something new something else, and the information age. With the internet access to every kind of idea, every kind of thought instantaneously available to us. My family used to uh, water ski on J. Percy Priest Lake. Uh, it's actually in Nashville. And we had a name for this lake. We called it Floating Rock Lake because it had rocks, dangerous rocks, submerged just below the water. And if you didn't know where they were, you would destroy your boat or injure somebody. 
In fact, a friend's boat ran over one of these floating rocks and sunk. And you had to, you had to go by the maps and follow the maps and know where these things were. And, and eventually, the Corps of Engineers started to put buoys over some of these submerged rocks so that people would know where not to drive their boat. Timothy's job was like that, to provide the maps and the buoys, to know where these hidden dangers were so that believers would not fall prey and be vulnerable to bad doctrine. Avoiding this duty means a failure to serve Christ well. In fact, a qualification for a pastor in Titus 1.9 says, an overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Pastors are evaluated by God on their ability and their faithfulness in this duty to point out error. But simply pointing out error is not enough. There's a second activity that marks a faithful faithful servant of Christ Jesus, and it's the corollary to pointing out error, and it is feeding on truth. Notice how Paul concludes verse 6 of 1 Timothy 4. This good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. This is the dominant activity in terms of time and attention and focus. Paul tells Timothy, you are to be constantly nourished. This is an ongoing activity of feeding oneself. This is a word that is used of of food and getting nourishment from food. And as a metaphor, it describes training and nurture in a set of ideas. And what is it that we are to be nourished on? Or what is Timothy to nourish himself on? On the words. On the words. He is to have a diet, not of food, but of truth. The very words of God. And these words are described in two ways. These are the words of the faith. And of the faith is the sum total of Christian belief. Similar to the way Jude uses it in Jude 3 to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith is this body of doctrine, this body of truth that is given to us in God's word. And he said, be nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine, or literally good doctrine. This is that same body of truth, but imparted little by little. Doctrine is teaching bit by bit this body of Christian truth. The good servant of Jesus Christ is to be continually nourished by the sum total of biblical truth by continually eating one bite at a time. And notice, the words of the faith and of sound doctrine are what Timothy has been following. Has been following. And this word for following is an intensive word. It means closely following with focused attention, a pursuit These are not new things to Timothy. He has been following them. This implies a perseverance in the truth, a contentment in the truth, and a trust in the truth. A perseverance meaning a a lifetime pursuit of these things, and and we'll never exhaust the infinite treasure of the Word of God. There's no reason to, to move outside the Word of God to come up with new ideas and new things to think about God. No one in their lifetime will exhaust this rich treasure. Timothy is to persevere in them. But it also requires a certain level of contentment, Uh, not a wanderlust or a restlessness to go somewhere else and find something new, been there, done that, I'm going to try something else. It requires a persevering contentment, which ultimately is a trust in God. God, your ways are higher than mine, your ways are better than mine, you know your people, you know the heart of man, you know the solution to man's problems, I will trust you and keep feeding on this word. And this is an effort that's required for a lifetime. One pastor said, the most effective ministers have been those who have persevered as students of the word. It's too easy to be moved from the truth if you're not committed to this kind of perseverance and contentment and trust. So many novelties out there, so many innovations 
and we're often plagued with boredom of what we've become familiar with. One of my mentors once said, I, I would rather be boring than wrong. Well, listen, the Word of God's never going to be boring. <laughs> but if we start with the commitment, I want to be pleasing to my Savior. I want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to trust Him and teach the same old things. There's a relationship between being nourished on the truth and pointing out error. If you love the truth and are feasting on the truth, if you're familiar with the truth, then you will notice when aberrations infiltrate. If you're familiar with a plot of ground, you'll notice when someone has disturbed the dirt to place a landmine. And if you have come to hear your shepherd's voice and recognize it and love him, your affections will be stirred for the words that come from his heart. And your affections will be stirred up against those things which contradict it. A failure to be agitated by threatening error is a failure to love the truth of God's word. Discerning error is part of the package of loving the truth. And what did this mean for Timothy? What did this look like? Uh, look at verse 7 and following. Have nothing to do with worldly fables. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Verse 9, we labor and strive. We have fixed our hope on the living God. Verse 11, prescribe and teach these things. Verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. Give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Don't neglect the spiritual gifts. Take pains with these things. Literally, be in these things. Be absorbed with them. And pay close attention to yourself and to your doctrine. What did all of this mean for Timothy? It meant not just the refutation of error, and not just the proclamation of the truth, but also the practice of it in his very life. There is a compelling integrity to the proclamation of truth when it has actually made a difference in the lives of God's people, and Timothy as an example. The Word of God is actually threatened when we don't proclaim the truth, and it's threatened when we don't practice the truth. One commentator said, the combination of exposing error and practicing the truth is a powerful antidote to heresy. My friends, we must not consider it distasteful to point out error. We rather ought to have a distaste for error. Such a love for the truth, we ought to have such an appetite for the truth, is so nourished by the truth that anything less than God's truth is unpalatable. I want to think about some implications for us, some things we need to consider. First and foremost, you need to know Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and the what? The truth and the life. He said, if you come to know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus is that truth. If, if you are not in Jesus then you do not have the capacity to discern between one person's opinion and another person's opinion. Which guru do I follow? Which nutritionist do I believe? Or any source of information out there, we don't have an objective grid for determining what path we should take. And Jesus is objectively the truth. And if you're not in Jesus, then 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is true. The God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers so that they will not believe the truth. If you have not yet come to the liberation that is in Christ, then you have not come to the light. You have not come to the truth and you are still under the grand conspiracy of Satan who has aligned all of his resources and all of his ideas against God and the truth. And we're all born in that conspiracy. And it takes a supernatural work of God to cause you to be born again, to come out of that darkness, to come out of those lies and into the truth. 
To know Jesus means not only knowing truth, but it also means the forgiveness of sin. My friends, sin is the great barrier between you and God, and not sin as an abstract concept, but your sin. Your sin against God is a barrier from you knowing him, enjoying him, living the way you were intended to live, and having eternal life. And if you surrender to Jesus Christ, placing your faith in his death in your place on the cross, instantaneously Jesus cancels out every sin you ever have committed or will commit. And all of that because God has set his purpose to love sinners like you and like me and provide a rescue for us to free us from slavery, to bring us to forgiveness and light and joy and life and truth. If you don't know Jesus, that is the first step for distinguishing between truth and error. You need to know him who is the truth. For those of you who know Christ, a significant point of um, application for us is read your Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. Read your Bible. Know the truth. Know God's heart. Know God's thoughts. third piece of instruction I would give you this morning is to seek discernment. Seek discernment. How do I do that? Uh, Number one, desire wisdom. Just desire wisdom. Know its value and long for it. And then begin to recognize that error exists. We can live naive and, and think there's no such thing as error, but just begin to recognize errors out there and we have enemies. Satan and the world and our own weaknesses... Error is possible, probable, real. Pray for discernment. Ask God to give you a discerning mind to be able to discriminate between truth and error. And read your Bible. Said it again. Read the whole thing. Again and again and again. Have a steady diet of feasting on God's word. And there's another part to having discernment, obedience, obedience, specifically obedience to what you know from God's word. To read God's word and to walk away and not obey God's word will leave you in a frightful condition and it will leave you vulnerable to bad ideas. Discernment is blunted when you're not living in obedience to what you know. And then... Another thing you need to do to gain discernment is to sit under systematic, expository teaching, preaching, and reading of God's Word. Again, a steady diet of Bible. Here's a fourth thing for us to think about. We can't only be against things. We can't only be against things. You don't want to build your identity as a Christian. We don't want our identity as a church to be about what we're against. We're not that, we're not that, we're not that, we're not that. I lived my life for a couple of years under what was called a discernment ministry that pointed its finger on all those wrong things out there. We don't want to be that. That's not helpful. In fact, that kind of a ministry places the focus of attention of error out there rather than a healthy self-examination right here. Our goal here is not to identify every error or every conceivable deviation. How do we know what to address? Well, when error threatens the church, the pastor's antenna go up. When error threatens God's precious people, then the church's shepherds approach it seriously. I have a contraband bookshelf in my office. Now everybody's going to want to come see it. It's behind closed doors. A couple of racks of books in there that I have read because people that I love say, hey, what do you think about this? And and when I get a book like that, I pick out a, a blue pen and a red pen. And I'll highlight things in blue that are, okay, that's all right. It's not harmful, or it's even good. And the red pen for the stuff that's harmful. And some of those books on that shelf are all red pen. 
And the pastors of this church have read books because people in this church have said, hey, pastor, what do you think about this? And we need to help our people with those things. You can't only be against things. <laughs> but you also can't be against being against things either. Right? And I know that this kind of rubs us the wrong way when we, we all want to just Rodney King, get along, love each other. The, the mantra of our day is just love. And any kind of a disagreement is by definition a lack of love. No, it's not. Identifying rat poison on the banquet table is not a lack of love, my friends. It is actually love and good faithful service to Jesus Christ. You can't be against being against things. This comes right out of God's word and is specific instruction for how to do church. You can't say that you love Jesus and fail to identify the errors that threaten the people that Jesus loves. Here's another thought. We, we need to pursue obedience. A compromised conscience is fertile ground for bad doctrine. A failure to stay on short accounts with God makes you uniquely vulnerable to theological error. And there's a reason for that. I want us to think through just a minute. If, if, you, if you have adhered to good doctrine and, and the truth of God's word, and yet you refuse to obey something you know that God expects of you, you create a hardness of heart inside of you. And you will begin to believe that the word of God doesn't work that the gospel isn't effective, that repentance doesn't accomplish what I thought it did. And the problem is not with the word of God, the truth of God, right doctrine, repentance, or rehearsing the gospel. The problem is my hard-heartedness and my seared conscience. Right? That is a trajectory toward apostasy. And it doesn't disprove the Bible. It says something about you. And when you start to disbelieve the Bible because you're not on short accounts with God, you are vulnerable to believe anything. And it happens over and over and over again. It's happened to people in this church. The flip side of this is that teachers of bad doctrine are often hypocrites, masking sinful commitments. Right? It's one thing for someone to naively believe something that goes against the Bible. It's another thing for someone to be advocating bad doctrine, teaching bad doctrine, trying to get disciples after himself to follow bad doctrine. And usually that is a mask for hidden sin, sinful commitments behind the scenes, excuses for wrong behavior. There's always a relationship between sinful behavior and wrong theology, right? Anytime I sin, there's something I'm not believing correctly or adequately about myself or God or the truth. There's always a relationship between sinful behavior and wrong theology. But there is often a relationship between wrong theology and a seared conscience. Let's talk for just a moment about the how-tos of identifying and addressing error. And, and this is so important. Some of you might be thinking, finally, this is the sermon I've been waiting for. I have the gift of discernment, and I'm going to go out there and blast everybody that's wrong with pastoral endorsement. No. no. Just as there is a spectrum of error, right, from cyanide to Twinkies to rice cakes or whatever, there's also a spectrum of the characters who purvey error. There are the naive. They just don't know any better. I haven't read that verse yet, so I, I didn't know that what I was saying contradicted the Word of God. There are the sincere but untaught. I, I'm trying really hard to know God's Word, and, and, and I just need to be sharpened. Then there's the hypocrite. And the hypocrite is wrong, and he knows it, but he finds some benefit in the doctrine that he holds. If I believe such and such, and I conveniently ignore these passages over here, then I can live the way I want to live. There is the wrong who is unteachable. 
inflexible and is actually teaching others. And then there is the insidious false teacher, the wolf who just has an appetite for sheep and wants to gobble them up and gets in secretly, masking what he knows he believes to try to look like the rest and destroy people's lives. And since there is a spectrum of error and people who hold error, by the way, everyone in this room has theological error somewhere. Did you know that? (laughs) We have not all arrived. None of us have arrived. And since there is a spectrum for error, there's not one biblical method for dealing with all error, right? At its very basic level, what are we doing? We are uh, singing to one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, teaching each other the truth on a regular basis. We're in small groups studying God's word together. We're all growing together. Whatever's wrong in the way we think, we want it to be shaved off. We want to grow. We want to grow up into Christ. So we're all growing in that way. But when it comes to people who are holding false doctrine in the church, damaging other people. There are a number of instructions the Bible gives. And you can write these down. I'll I'll read them to you. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 tells us this. This is Paul writing to the same Timothy that he's writing to in this passage we've studied this morning. He says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So what should the attitude be from the very beginning for God's slave in correcting theological error? Gentleness, compassion, hope. Titus 3 gives us another angle Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. That's critical. A factious man is one who is bringing harm to the church by causing division. And there's kindness in a first and a second warning. And love does not mean, oh, let him live, let bygones be bygones. No, love for the church and love for that man is actually to reject him after a first and second warning. And Paul goes on to tell Titus, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning and is self-condemned. Paul told the Roman believers in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, I urge you, brethren, and this is to Christians. In other words, discernment is not just the job of the pastor, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Keep your eye on them and turn away from them. Titus 1.9 tells us what elders are supposed to do to refute those who contradict. It's their job. And 2 John 10 and 11 gives us this warning. If anyone comes to you and does not bring the teaching, do not receive him into your house and don't give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. That's a scary thought. My alma mater, Bible college, founded on teaching the Word of God, has invited scholars, respectable scholars in the world of New Testament scholarship, who deny the gospel to speak publicly on their campus. That's a violation of 2 John 10 and 11. The recommended book of the month uh, for this month, recommended by the elders, is called Truth War. It's available at the book table. It deals with some of these issues related to discernment and the importance of discriminating truth and error. Commend that to you. I want to close with a quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones who spent the better part of the 20th century in pastoral ministry fighting for the faith, the faith, the body of truth contained in the New Testament, the gospel itself. And he fought against the tide of those who were forsaking the word of God and forsaking the gospel under the banner of ecumenism, 
let's all get together and hold hands. Anybody that names Christ, we should get together. And Lloyd-Jones spent his life and his ministry stemming that tide. He said this, if a man asserts his own point of view, the result of his own thinking in an intolerant manner, well, he's a bore. Not a bore, not boring, but like a bull in a china shop. He is not to be tolerated. In other words, if, if a man stands here and spouts his own ideas intolerantly, don't tolerate that guy. But when you are given truth from God, then you have no right to be anything but intolerant of that which contradicts. Let's pray. God, thank you for these words this morning. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your truth, which is good and beautiful and life-giving and reveals you. God, would you create in us or grow in us an appetite for your word, an appetite for your word that causes us to be nourished on it continuously, day by day, bit by bit, and the whole thing, that we might love what you love and find distasteful that which contradicts you. Grant us love and patience with one another and with others as we seek to do these things in a gentle and patient way that honors you and more than anything brings attention to the truth and to your lovely Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.